Hey, folks, welcome back to Scarborough, my last podcast. Uh, I don't mean that in an ominous way. Uh, I just mean that I'm going to work on this one till I die. Um, if you don't know, uh, this this show, the concept of it is I talk about something that I think is good, and then I talk about something that I think is horrible, uh, and nothing in between, no gray areas uh, around here. Um, so let's let's get started with the good, shall we? What is good? Stanley Kubrick is good. That's all I know in in, in my my years of watching movies. And, uh, you know, I'm the type of guy who out of my movies and my stories, and my art, I need to I am trying to not think about things. So I need it to be good. I need good art. And Stanley Kubrick, uh, in a singular fashion, um, made movies that uh, nothing compares to them. Um, you know, and that's that's regardless of when you're looking. Like, movies never got better than Stanley Kubrick. They stand the test of time. Uh, and I'm talking about, like, all of his shit. I haven't seen every movie that he's made, uh, and I know, whatever, I'm a poser. But um, the movies that I have seen uh, and what I know about that guy uh, fascinate me, and they occupy a lot of my brain every day. Uh, and that's both uh, uh, consciously and subconsciously. Um, I've based a lot of my life on things I've learned from Stanley Kubrick movies. He's also, he's one of those guys, I kind of got into this in the last episode, but he was a, not a good guy. Um, he was an asshole and definitely an egomaniac, but I like artists like that. I, for some reason, I kind of respect it. I don't respect everything that he did. He was a maniac. Uh, but I understand being, you. I, I really don't feel like you can be a great artist without being eccentric. Uh, I think that there are some people who succeed in art uh, while being boring. Um, but I think the good ones... Uh, I think that the good artists have problems. There's a reason why they're able to um, uh, focus uh, and and just completely throw themselves into a project uh, and not give a fuck about anything else and and make the art. And Stanley Kubrick was like that. A um, couple of fun things about Stanley Kubrick you may not know. He was uh, a brilliant chess player. And uh, when he was coming up in, uh, I think it was New York, I think he lived in New York, he was a photographer early in his career, and he would, um, he, he was a chess hustler out on the street. He would make money that way, uh, which is, I, I like people like that. I've, I've met other people who uh, live a similar lifestyle where they get really good at poker or something, and that's all they really have to do. Um, because people like that are just, uh, they've found a way to hack the system to remain a child their whole life, basically. And that's, that's kind of what being an artist is. You find a way to turn your, uh, play thing into, uh, money, which I will never figure out, but I, I will continue to, uh, press on, um, through poverty and suffering and mental illness and substance abuse. That's what it's all about. Um, Kubrick was, uh, aside from being very creative, very brilliant, he had, um, he had a very, very, uh, um, distinguishable style, a unique style, uh, that started when he was a still photographer shooting 35 millimeter. Um, Kubrick, uh, one of the things that I've taken from Stanley Kubrick, and I use this in my paintings constantly, is he was obsessed with the idea of symmetry. He was obsessed with triangles. Um, and a lot of his compositions, uh, they have an element of symmetry there. And this is, in general, a great recipe for art. Have an element of symmetry and then have variations for the eye to go back and forth on. Like you can look at this tree and it looks symmetry or symmetrical when you first look at it, 
but there's uh, this branch is a little bit lower, but it compensates by bending up like this. And I do this constantly in my paintings. I balance things out with something similar, and it looks the same, but then you look closer and it's not. And you can see that in both like his uh, um, iconic uh, like uh, 2001 Space Odyssey or The Shining, uh, or even in his comedies um, like uh, uh, Doctor Strangelove, which to this day, if you have not watched Doctor Strangelove, it is the greatest uh, black comedy of all time uh, in the sense that it, it takes something that in the year 1964 was a very, very real thing in people's mind uh, as far as nuclear Armageddon. They had just experienced the, uh, the Bay of Pigs incident and the fucking uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh and people thought the world was about to end, and it almost did. But Stanley Kubrick made this comedy called Dr. Strangelove, and it has Peter Sellers in it from the Pink Panther series, and he plays uh, like three different characters. It makes fun of the military uh, to the point where it, it pissed a lot of people off when it came out. And I remember my parents somehow showed that to me as a kid, even though they are, they, I grew up in a fucking neocon, uh, like Reagan era, um, household. My parents loved Rush Limbaugh. They loved Ronald Reagan, trickle down economics. They, they absolutely fell for everything. Um, and they, but they somehow, uh, one, I, I, I don't know, how they did the mental gymnastics to enjoy that movie while maintaining their belief system, but they showed it to me. And we had a family friend over at the time who was a, uh, um, uh, he was a former, uh, submarine, uh, personnel, I, whatever, seaman, uh, you know, a submarine guy. Uh, during the Civil War, he or not the Civil War, the Cold War, he was in uh, um, a, a nuclear-powered and nuclear-armed submarine, like Hunt for Red October type of shit. And I remember w we all had a family movie movie night, and we all loved it. And he, that guy did not find it funny at all, um, which kind of shows me that it's good. Anything that makes like fucking. Uh, patriotic, uh, what old fucking cold warriors um, get their panties in a bunch is there's a good chance it's good art or good music or good whatever. Um, I love Stanley Kubrick. Uh, I also, you know, a lot of people might criticize the movie A Clockwork Orange. Um, it's a disturbing movie uh, to a lot of people. Um, because of certain things that the the protagonist uh, who is uh, not even an anti-hero, he is a bad dude in uh, uh, a Clockwork Orange. But I think that uh, I think uh, there's a reason why I uh, I inherently respect movies like that um, that go. Uh, I mean, th that movie goes hard. It, f it and it does so in a way that. It can only be justified if you're saying something profound, and A Clockwork Orange has many, many um, just, like, very profound uh, talking points and, like, uh, ways to look at uh, morality, criminal justice, uh, technology, um, and it's all done in this, like, beautiful dystopian um like this is where art's headed. This is where technology and culture uh, are headed. Uh, it's it looks crazy, um, and I feel like when you do that, uh, when you make a futuristic, like a very stylized um, aesthetic, it kind of softens uh, maybe some of the violence or ultra violence that takes place in that movie, but. Um, I respect artists that are willing to go that far. I like, uh, I, sometimes th their work is not for me, but I respect that about them. I like, um, there's one movie that I like a lot by Lars von Trier, and it's kind of 
the same thing where it's like uh, the house that Jack built. It's it's like American Psycho, except for I in my mind much more disturbing, um, and it's not. I it's it's pretty fucking funny too, honestly. But um, yeah, we like dark art around here. Uh, enough with the good. Let's talk about the horrible. Um, I was thinking about, uh, someone that I really, uh, reserve a lot of, um, rage towards. And it's, I mean, it, I go back and forth on whether or not it's rage. Um, I think about grifters a lot, uh, successful grifters. Um, and, I uh, I wonder their intentions. Like, are they willing? Are are they wittingly um, deceiving people? Do they know that they're saying lies? Um, for example, Candace Owens. Uh, I get the feeling that Candace Owens knows exactly what she's doing. You know, um, she knows that she is appealing towards uh, uh, white people. Uh, who are upper middle class who want to be justified uh, for their racism. Um, and she, I feel like she knows that. That's why she does what she does. She's figured out how to make money on it. And it's such a cynical point of view. And the things that she says are so ridiculous and over the top to where it's like, it's, if it wasn't so fucked up, it would be admirable. Um, because she, at the end of the day, she is hoodwinking uh, um, some very stupid people. Uh, and I like that about her. Uh, but I, I feel like she's so good at remaining in character all the time that I, there's no way you could get her to break on that. I feel like she, uh, I don't know. Um, I, I I brought up Candace Owens and the, the idea of a grifter because I've 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 gone back and forth in my mind on whether or not Jordan Peterson is uh, an evil, uh, you know, just greedy um, uh, deceiver, or if he uh, is developmentally disabled, um, because I I don't see. He the things that he his antics and the way he is able to cry on command, which I I think with that when I watch Jordan Peterson his crying videos, which pop up on my fucking YouTube YouTube algorithm constantly because they know that it infuriates me, but he'll just start crying just constantly, and it's it's like you have to wonder has his body just figured out that. Uh, crying results in like f uh, whatever nourishment or something like food uh and he, he he just biologically starts crying because he knows that makes money deep down um or is it just completely an act um uh, you know and i just how can someone like that who like he clearly like if you look at the beginning of his career with, like, the 12 Rules for Life, it's like he's always been an insufferable dork uh, if you have a brain and you any self-awareness. You can tell that he's a fucking, like, he's just a little boy, like a little fucking dork. Um, but he's had some great things to say about, like, helping yourself, um, uh, you know, challenging yourself. Uh, keeping your life in order. These things, like, actually help people. But he uh, he's allowed his career to go into an area where you can tell he just, like, when it comes to politics and, uh, you know, if you listen to him talk about Marxism or uh, anything uh, philosophy-related, he just, he... He uh he kind of has the maturity level of just a a fucking a, a an unintelligent eleven year old like a, a stupid eleven year old, um one who's been convinced by uh whatever Ben Shapiro, um to think a certain way. Uh, and I just I I I don't understand. Uh, is someone like that? Is Jordan Peterson, um. 
is he evil at heart or is he misguided and stupid? Because it's it has to be that. It has to be one of the two. And he's um <clears throat> I don't know. I feel like I would like to think that if I were uh and I will never be successful on that level. I get that. Um but uh I would like to think that if I were like that and I started paying attention to the types of uh, dipshits who consume my stuff and are willing to pay tickets, uh, ticket fees to come see me or what, and buy my books. Like, I don't know. Wouldn't it be just like kind of a red flag? Like the, the, the types of fucking morons. Supposedly he's not a moron. Um, but it, uh, I don't know. I really don't know what that guy. Um, my sister is uh, <sighs> a lot of my family, you know, like the conservative, um, you know, these are the types of people who consume Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro and Candace Owens. But they're also in denial about it. They, um, you know, I'll see them retweet Ben Shapiro and then I'll bring it up later that they get their ideas from Ben Shapiro and the fucking Heritage Foundation. And they just have complete amnesia about it. They're like, oh, I don't watch Ben Shapiro. You know, they're in denial. And it's just like, I would respect you so much more if you just fucking lived your truth. And also, you know, let me talk to you about it. I can... You don't have to live that like that. I can't imagine that consuming Daily Wire content is a fun way of life. There is no way that if if you're getting your news, not that getting your news through Al Jazeera is fun either, I'll tell you that, but at least it's rooted in, like, fucking empathy for um, people who deserve it, you know? It's not... Uh, those Daily Wire things and, and all conservative media is kind of manufactured by, uh, I mean, indirectly and directly fucking oil money. <laughs> the Heritage Foundation. Look it up. If you're a conservative or a li libertarian or whatever, um, and you or you think you are, uh, look up some stuff about the Heritage Foundation and, and uh, just— um, where their money comes from, why they have an interest in funding certain uh, intellectuals. And it, it you know, it, and maybe your ideology is more, you're more well-read than me, and, and uh, you know, maybe it'll hold up. I hope it does, um, but I doubt it. Look up the Heritage Foundation, my brother. Um, all right, I got to go. <clears throat> Hey, thanks for watching. If you liked what you saw, hit the like and subscribe buttons and check out one of these other videos. We'll see you next time.